Thank you so much for taking the time to explore how adolescent development principles apply in juvenile court. My name is Mary Ann Scally. I'm the Executive Director of the National Juvenile Defender Center, and I'm delighted to be here today with three distinguished presenters who will talk with us about applying developmental principles in youth court concepts. First, we'll begin with the Honorable Karen Ashby. Judge Karen Ashby is a judge on the Colorado Court of Appeals. She was appointed to the position in August 2013. Prior to that, Judge Ashby served on the Denver Juvenile Court from September 98 to 2013. She served as presiding judge from 1999 through 2013. In her private practice, Judge Ashby emphasized work in criminal and family court cases and took cases from trial all the way through appeals. Then we'll hear from Judge Ernestine Gray. Judge Gray has served with distinction on the Orleans Parish Juvenile Court for over 30 years. Previously, Judge Gray was a trial attorney with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Judge Gray has also been the president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges and the National Court Appointed Special Advocate. Judge Gray has received many national awards and recognition for her work and has testified in front of numerous legislators. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Antoinette Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh is a board certified forensic psychologist and she's a lecturer at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. She's the former clinical director of the Juvenile Justice Division of the Cook County Juvenile Court Clinic and served as a clinical professor at Northwestern University's School of Law for 10 years. Thank you so much to our distinguished panel for joining us today. So before we begin, we're actually gonna just walk through an overview of the presentation for today. We're gonna to begin with a short um, introduction to the project that brought us here today with our judicial counsel at the National Juvenile Defender Center. Then we'll have a conversation about key developmental principles in youth court. And finally, we'll hear from our judges about how we can apply those principles in youth court today. So how did this project begin? Well, we had a group of judges who we invited to educate us as advocates about judicial decision making in youth court. And one of the conversations we had led to a discussion about the application of adolescent development in juvenile court. And from there, we developed a bench card. If you'd like to refer to the bench card during the presentation, please go to njdc.info slash bench cards. And you'll see the concepts that we're talking about are actually reflected on the card. The bench card was developed in partnership with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges and the State Justice Institute. The five principles we're gonna focus on today are key principles that our Judicial Council believe to be most important as they consider youth before them in the court system. One, we know that adolescents are not just small adults. They are constitutionally different. Two, adolescents are less culpable and more capable. Three, then we'll talk about how adolescents develop at different rates in social, emotional, and physical and cognitive domains. Fourth, we'll discuss how adolescent development and learning are profoundly affected by early childhood experiences. And finally, we'll talk about how secure relationships promote successful adolescents. After discussing those five principles, we'll turn back to our judges and hear about how they apply those principles in juvenile court decision making. So, Let's begin with principles of adolescent development. Judge Ashby. Well, Marianne mentioned that on the bench card there are five different principles, and I'm going to start with principle one, which is that adolescents are not just small adults, they are constitutionally different. And really this principle is drawn from the Supreme Court cases that in recent years, since 2005, have really discussed how juveniles and youth are different than adults and what the legal and constitutional implications of that are. There are really key, three key developmental characteristics of youth that have uh, been highlighted in the Supreme Court cases that we're going to talk about today. One is that there's an inability of youth to self-regulate. I think we've all probably experienced that in both our legal and professional lives. Number two, that they are especially sensitive to external influences. And third, they have a poor ability to appreciate the long-term consequences of their behavior and their conduct. And these differences are grounded in both 
maturational and biological development. And we will hear from Dr. Kavanaugh later specifically what those developmental and maturational differences are. But as far as principle one, this quote, or this principle, really comes out of language from the JDB versus North Carolina case, where they quote Eddings versus Oklahoma, where, and say, our history is replete with laws and judicial recognition that children cannot be viewed simply as miniature adults. So let's walk through the various cases. The first case, as you'll see on the slide, is in 2005, Roper versus Simmons. And this was a case that abolished the death penalty for persons who were under the age of 18. And specifically, in the case, the Supreme Court talks about the immaturity and the recklessness of youth, that they're more susceptible to peer pressure, and that they are developing, and therefore their behavior as a youth is something that's transient and not permanent. So that's a reason we may need to look at them differently than we do adults. We'll then look at Graham versus Florida from 2010, which held that a juvenile life without parole sentence is unconstitutional for a non-homicide offense. Then in JDB versus North Carolina, which is different because this is actually a juvenile case handled in a juvenile context, not in adult court. And Miller versus Alabama in 2012, abolishing the mandatory life without parole sentence for juveniles. And finally, Montgomery versus Louisiana, where the Supreme Court said that it is a substantive change to the law, and therefore the, the principle that we are going to treat youth differently is going to be retroactive, and the life without parole sentence will apply to juveniles who were sentenced prior to the date of the Montgomery case. So let's look at Roper versus Simmons. And really, specifically, again, they talked about the immaturity and the recklessness and the, the susceptibility to peer influence and how their behavior and uh, development is transient. And they talk about the three key points in that case. And I think what's important with respect to both Roper and all of these cases is the decisions of the Supreme Court really relied significantly on the research regarding youth development and how that should play out in legal cases and how judges are handling cases and how youth are being prosecuted. We then had Graham versus Florida in 2010. Um, and the Supreme Court really recognized that because juveniles have lessened culpability, they really should be deserving of less, ha less harsh sentences. And if we are going to be looking at imposing harsh sentences on juveniles, we need to make sure that we are taking into account the developmental uh, issues, the developmental research, and clearly they came down in Graham versus Florida and said when you do that, then you can't impose life without parole sentences on youth for non-homicide offenses. That's disproportionate and it doesn't adequately take those developmental differences into account. JDB in 2011 is different, as I said, because there, this is a juvenile case. It was a juvenile who was being questioned. And the Supreme Court, uh, the majority, said ultimately that law enforcement needs to take into account the age of the child in applying a Miranda advisement and deciding how to view the youth's understanding of the advisement and whether they are or are not in custody. And the, the Supreme Court, as the quote says, they really lack the experience, perspective, and judgment to recognize and avoid choices that could be detrimental to them. Certainly, we see in adult cases the Miranda custody is based upon a reasonable person. But the Supreme Court made clear that when we're talking about something that is objectively um, observable to the law enforcement officer and 
that does have significant differences on how, how the juvenile may be perceiving what's going on, that really needs to be taken into account uh, as far as Miranda advisements. We then move to the Miller versus Alabama case in 2012. And in Miller, they said that a mandatory juvenile life without parole sentence is not constitutionally uh, permissible. That does not mean that a juvenile can't be sentenced to life without parole, but it recognized that there have, has to be a real assessment by the court imposing the sentence as to the juvenile, their likelihood of being able to be habilitated or rehabilitated, and to look at whether, given the transient nature of their behavior and the fact that they don't always act with uh, intent, that they're impulsive and reckless, that that needs to be taken into account. And we can't just, as a blanket uh, sentence, say that juveniles can receive a mandatory life without parole sentence. And ultimately, Montgomery versus Louisiana, there was a large split between jurisdictions regarding whether the Miller versus Alabama case was going to be retroactive or not. And the court in Montgomery really looked at all of the cases going back to Roper and what the foundation was regarding developmental uh, characteristics of youth that under, was the underpinning of those cases and ultimately said that the rule that we have applied in those cases and the need to recognize the maturational differences of children needs to, is a substantive change, not a procedural change. And therefore, under Teague, we need to uh, apply that retroactively. I know in Colorado, our Supreme Court had determined that you did not need to apply Miller retroactively. And Colorado Supreme Court and appellate uh, courts have had to make significant changes now to those cases that were pending um, and that are impacted by Miller. We're going to move next to principle two, and Judge Gray is going to explain a little more about how the developmental differences as to children have legal, legal implications and constitutional implications. Mm -hmm. 